Center. And he's not here yet. Mel and I met with him today and a few uh, of his cohorts. So in lieu of that, Jeff and Neil, do you want to speak briefly? Hello. Um, we have Jeff Glassberg and Neil Kamen from the uh, Northwest Supervisor High School. Is it high school board? Yeah. It's Edmonds Union High School. Um, and they asked if they could just take a few minutes just to brief us as a group on the bond vote coming up and the issues that it pertains to. And I thought for those people that hadn't read about it or heard about it, if they saw it on TV, they might learn something as well. So we'll give you guys a little bit of time just to kind of give us a quick overview and rationale behind the project. Great. Good. I'll start. And uh, since I am the chance yeah. elected yeah. representative on the board, uh, a few things are probably on the minds of our voters. And so we're coming before you tonight just to tell you a little bit about the bond, but also a little bit more about a larger strategy that the school board has been developing around facility maintenance for our facility. Everybody knows from the news that the auditorium is now closed, uh, that the kitchen is deficit and very old and code non-compliant. Um, and there is a variety of issues, and I'll take you through those pieces one by one in a relatively brief verbal presentation here. But I just want you to know up front that as we come before the voters, we're not doing so in another sort of let's go for it again kind of a try. That these are extremely necessary facility upgrades for our community's facility. And so as a pretext, or not a pretext, as a precursor to that, and maybe for anybody who doesn't know the backstory, um, just rewind a couple of years here and begin when some of our um, school facility needs became particularly acute during 2010 and then 2011, it became pretty clear to us that the roof was leaking more and more. We were hearing more and more from the faculty about the condition of the auditorium. We were getting reports from the Department of Health about the condition of the kitchen. We were seeing water making its way into our building, your building, um, and a variety of other things and decided it was time to bring forward to the voters um, a package of improvements, which you all know we did in two stages last year. And you all know that those were rejected both times. Um, and just to rewind a little further, why we had to bring such a consequential package forward is because, as we all know, we're coming out of recession time. Nobody really has a lot of capacity to pay for new stuff right now. Nobody has a lot of capacity to pay more taxes. Our Virgins High School Board has been mindful of that for a long time, and over the last three years, we've really pushed pretty rugged, pretty hard, pretty um, sharp budgets, where we maintained our increases to uh, less than four one year, which seems like a big budget increase, I understand, then to negative 2%, then to negative 0.2% in, uh, in the interceding couple of years leading up to where we are now. We did some program cutting, we did some staff cutting, which we had to do, but we also had to defer maintenance to the facility again and again and again. And even leading up to that time, that's one of the things that's easy to um, remove from the budget when you're looking at are we supporting our teachers to support our kids or do we invest in the facility? And so there's been a pattern of um, unfortunately not supporting the facility needs as much as needed to. Hence, we came before the voters last year with a a uh, $6.4 million request for a very consequential upgrade, which would have done lots of things inside the facility and outside to basically put our school, our community's facility to a fully modern stat state. That failed. We understood the, uh, the tax implications were too big. Our voters weren't ready for that. We came back with a revised request, um, splitting some of those components, splitting the components we felt the school needed interior and the components exterior and allowing voters to make a choice as to whether they wanted to support the interior and then incrementally also support the exterior. Neither of those issuances passed, so we heard that message. I've read in the paper that we haven't heard that message, but we really have heard that message. And still the roof kept leaking over the winter and then over the spring, and it really became acute. And so we met with you, Mel, and, and some of the folks on your board uh, in the spring to strategize about how are we going to do this. We can't come back out for another bond vote right away. The law says we can only do two in a year. Um, so we requested to the voters of the district that they supported a $600,000 bond request, short-term, five-year loan, not a full 20-year bond, 
to fix our roof. That was supported. We did that work. We've just completed that work. The roof doesn't leak anymore, notwithstanding what you heard in the news during the uh, restoration of the roof where there was a couple of short-term hiccups. But, you know, that work is done. So let's step back and look at the rest of the facility. Those facility needs remain acute. The, wor the, the words that you've read on the page of the Addison Independent about the auditorium status are true. We received very um, discouraging and frankly dangerous safety inspections on the condition of the rigging in our auditorium. The board decided and the administration decided for safety reasons and um, frankly because some of that stuff was uninsurable <laughs> that we had to take it down. Um, which means that the auditorium is not available to service the kids and the music, the arts facility, the classroom, the auditoria that happens in there and all those things. We subsequently went and did additional work to determine whether we could just go in there and quickly restore some elements to put a show in there to allow the school to function this year while we regroup. And what we found out from our structural engineers is in fact the roof structure is such that it's at its maximum load with the air handlers that are up there now. And in order to restore the auditorium to its functionality that it's had and have it be compliant and safe and engineeringly sound, we need to move those air handlers. So that's part of the package I'm here talking to you about. And I've gotten close to telling you some of the elements in great detail and I want to pull back one more time and talk a little bit about the larger strategy and then we can go through the elements of the package that we're asking for. We, we, we don't have all night for that. Very good. <laughs> so really under Jeff's leadership, because he's got some skills that some of us don't have because of his, his background, we've sort of developed a, um, a plan for managing the facility, which has four elements to it. The first was that short-term fix of the roof, and that, that is done. The second is to very, very sharply prioritize and hone up the budget of a bond request for those things that just have to happen to put that school back to code compliancy and full functionality. That's what we're here talking about tonight. The third is to develop a deferred maintenance plan for the facility that we will then forthrightly plan through our annual budgeting so that we don't come to a place where in three years we need to replace some heating elbow joints and it's going to cost $25,000 and we had no idea and we have to deficit for it or figure out some way to spend it. And then the fourth and <coughs> most important piece is developing a capital fund. All of our elementary schools have capital funds. The high school does not. We haven't for a long time. It's time. And the board actually passed uh, the first reading of a policy that would require an annual request of a capital fund so that we don't have to come back to our voters on a regular basis and say, oh, something else is broke and we just don't have the money to fix it. So fast forwarding to the bond issuance itself, it's a $2.8 million request, which is still a large number. 600,000 of that is in fact the, the short-term note that we just did for the roof. We'll wrap that in there. That's gonna do a considerable amount of savings. I have the numbers if we have the time to get into them or the interest. Restore the auditorium to its current or its prior functional state, which means putting lights that work, not a crazy amazing performance system, but lights that work to allow kids to perform their music. Um, put a light box in there that is code compliant, safe, and will not electrocute my own son when he rigs the lights and sets them up. Clean the auditorium, clean the seats, replace the curtains that were non-fireproofed and frankly falling apart, and give it some paint. Uh, the kitchen, we maintain that the kitchen needs to be replaced. It is 1958 vintage. Maybe we can get some money for that stuff on eBay. I don't know. But um, it, it really needs to be replaced to become code compliant. It's energy. It's extremely energy inefficient. The heating and cooling, the, the cooling boxes, freezer, refrigerator, are in the central core of the kitchen, which means that they heat the interior of the building um, in order to produce cold in the interior of a building that is heated. Uh, there's some site work that needs to be done both for safety perspective to improve handicap parking to improve the surfaces of the lots which are beginning to crumble um, and to address the water that's coming into the <coughs> pardon me into the school a little bit of touch-up work on the roofing uh, the roofing is good it's sound there's a little bit of fascia and soffit work that needs to be finished up that the budget didn't support what am I missing the last bit I feel like there's a fourth element mm -hmm. nope okay so We've got numeric details for all that. Uh, 
Here's a numeric detail that I think our taxpayers will want to know is what's the tax implication of that. In the first year after, if this is successfully passed, it will be $11 on a $100,000 home, peaking at $37 on a $100,000 home in year two and declining thereafter. We're going to publish all these numbers, obviously. Um, we've got a public meeting warned for the 6th in the high school. Or sorry, sorry, it's 6 o'clock. PM on the third. Thank you, Jeff, in the high school. So that was information from a fire hose, maybe, and just happy to take questions or get into the details if you want. Do you have any good questions? Okay. So there's you, you've got the, the meeting on the third. Yep. Yep. What, I mean, I really wanted people to be aware of what was happening. So the board knows how to contact you. Neil, you live yep. here. Jeff lives in Waltham. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about it, but I think that um, for now and for this forum, I thank you. Sure. Unless, is there anything else you want to bring up? Jeffrey, you have any comments uh, you want to I, bring I up? I just wanted to mention we really appreciated the opportunity to, to meet with the city council back in June when we were wrestling with what to do about the roof and how to sequence this. So thank you for the opportunity to work cooperatively at that point. We're hoping that the community will support this bond issue. It really is a, a short list of necessary work for a building this community already owns. We need to maintain it. It's deferred maintenance. So that's the bottom line with that. So thank Great. you for your time. One quick question. Sure. So if the, I'm going to say when the bond calls for this. Are you going to start the funds for um, future in that that first year? Or are we going to absorb that in the fixing and then right. put it away? Or, or Take that. That's going to wind up being a separate vote each year of the voters, just as it is as the, okay. at the elementary okay. school. So it's a separate question that's put before the voters every year as to whether or not they will fund the reserve. And there are strings attached to that, and the board should be restricted in how it spends that money only for long-term capital items would be the, the intent. And, and you're right. We, you know, we can't swallow everything all, all at once. But clearly the idea was that we're approaching the voters in a way that shows uh, responsible stewardship going forward so that we try to avoid situations where things we know are, that are going to need to be replaced like a roof have us coming back to borrow money. We should be setting that money aside. And there's other stuff we should be paying cash for. That's the culture we're trying to shift toward. On the air handlers, are you going to be completely removing them off, this, off the roof? Or are they... Yeah, what's so they're going to be gone? What, what the plan is there is that those handlers will be, they, first of all, they need to be replaced. They cannot be run. They're so old oh, and okay. decrepit that by running them, you can't hear what's happening in the, in the performance space, in the auditorium. What we're going to do is we're going to get them off the roof and onto the vestibule roof. So that main entryway as you go in and it's on your, you know, the auditorium right. on your right. So we'll put them there running ductwork over the top. That will take that load off the roof okay. and allow the roof to then absorb the weight of the rigging. Right. Anybody else? So if I could just have one final closing statement is yep. that, I mean, there's all sorts of perspectives. Some of, our, some of our citizens will support this. Some of our citizens will not. And some of our citizens will want to know more. <laughs> and so as you all are approached, I hope you'll feel free to let people know to call me or to call Chris Cousineau. There are, you know, there are elected representatives on the board. And we're happy to share information at any time. That's reasonable. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Neil. Very much, folks. Thanks for coming. Okay, next, we will have our next guest, Howard Rake. Howard, you were a minute late, so we had to start with someone else. I'm sorry about that. For which I thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> We're very punctual here. Well, I hope, hope you excuse us. Howard is the president of CHP International, the yeah. uh, new uh, operator of Northland Job Corps. And uh, we met today, talked for a while, Mel and I and Howard, and he'd like to brief the council on the organization and what their plans are for the, for the job course. And I know you don't have all night, so I won't. <laughs> take more than a few minutes. Thank you all, um, Mel and Bill and the rest of you for
for uh, having us over tonight. I'll introduce briefly the pretty faces that came with me. Uh, some of you know, maybe all of you know, Tony Stainings, who we hope is, is going to uh, take over again as Center Director of Neuroscience Job Corps Center. Behind Tony is Lauren Morales. Lauren Morales is a senior associate with our, with our company, CHP International. And she is a former Job Corps Center director. She directed the Job Corps Center in Chicago a few years back and is the person who, in our organization, has the most in-depth familiarity with the Job Corps program as it is run at a center. The company has done other work with the Job Corps that I'll tell you about in a moment, but Lauren is kind of our brains for Job Corps Center operations. And sitting next to Lauren is Brian Fox. Brian Fox is president and CEO of a company called Education and Training Resources. They are a major subcontractor that's going to be working with CHP International <coughs> in the operation of the North Lens Job Corps Center. So uh, before you ask, you, you're going to ask what does CHP stand for? So I'll tell you that the full legal name of CHP International is CHP International. Uh, I like to tell people when I'm asked the question, though, and I hope, I hope we'll earn the right to come back and say it again a year from now. When people ask me what CHP stands for, I say it stands for excellence. And I hope, you'll, I hope, we'll, we'll, I hope we'll produce results that will make you agree with that. So uh, a few brief words about CHP International, and then say some things about uh, ETR as well. We've been in business uh, since 1978, and during a good chunk of that time, our company did uh, training with Peace Corps volunteers in several countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. We, and we became interested in working with the Job Corps because it seemed like a way that we could take some of the experience that we had acquired doing training, the design of training to, to, to reach particular learning objectives, take that and transplant it in some fashion to a domestic program uh, with, a, with a valid social purpose, which I uh, believe very strongly the Job Corps is. And so many years after we first had that idea in mind, uh, we now find ourselves with the award of the contract for Northlands. The way that came about is through a partnership between CHP and ETR. ETR has a lot more experience running Job Corps centers than we do. We're, we're starting. We've been working with outreach and admissions, which is the recruitment of young people from the program, and career transition services, which is providing those services to the kids <coughs> when they finish the program that they need to get attached to the workforce and we hope stay attached to the workforce. So we, uh, among other contracts, we run the Outreach and Admissions and Career Transition Services contract for the New England region, and we have our project office here in Virgins, and you, many of you probably know our project director, who's a predecessor of Bill's by the name of Sue Clark. I think many of you know her. So she is our project director with her office on Main Street uh, here in Virgins. Well, we partnered with ETR because that partnership was attractive to us, to both companies for a number of reasons. One of which was that as are many of, many government contracts, many federal government contracts, not just with Job Corps and not just with the Department of Labor, this one was a set aside for small businesses and um, Brian's company, Education and Training Resources, was kind of getting punished for its success. They had started out as a small business and now today operate four job course centers, two in the state of New York, one in, uh, in Connecticut and one in Georgia. But as a small business, they were ineligible to compete for the North Lines Job Corps Center and so that provided an opportunity for the two companies to work together because we were eligible. It was a way for us to grow toward a vision that we had held for a long time and a way for ETR to participate in this, <coughs> in this endeavor as well. Uh, I want to say just a few words about, about what our vision is for Northlands Job Corps Center. Now, I'm aware that 
there's a degree of ambivalence in Virginians about the Northlands Job Corps Center that stems from a variety of things. I know part of it has to do with difficult negotiations between the state of Vermont and the federal government, and there are probably some other things, I know there are some other things that have to do with um, the, 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 the profile of the center in the community. So I was mentioning earlier today that when I was on the plane this morning, I pulled out our proposal and started to read it from the beginning. And I'm mentioning this because the first 30 or 40 pages, the first 30 or 40 pages of the, of the proposal that we submitted to the federal government in an attempt to win this contract have to do with outreach and partnership development here in Virginia <coughs> and in the surrounding area. This is one of our two or three highest priorities. We know, we know that it's been rough going, and part of this has to do, well, you all know plenty of the reasons. Part of it has to do with the crazy year that the Department of Labor and the Office of Job Corps went through last year, culminating in the, uh, in the, uh, the government, federal government sequester, but that was not all of it. And, that, and, and, and one, of the, one of the consequences of everything that went on last year was that our predecessor, Alutic, kept having its contract extended, and when that happens, it creates instability, it creates doubt, it creates difficulty in maintaining continuity, and all of those things plagued them, and I guess that, in a sense, these are things that we inherit. So our highest priority, I would say, is reaching out to the community here, to employers, to civic organizations, to, uh, to, to, uh, to nonprofits, to uh, faith-based organizations, and on and on, and to try to, to restore or, or to create, in the first place, uh, a, a network of relationships that will help support the Northlands Job Corps Center, and in turn, to have the Northlands Job Corps Center working in the community and with the community on things that are of importance to the community. A couple of things that get mentioned all the time, I, I didn't know about it before a few days ago, but a couple of things that get that mentioned all the time are that the uh, urban forestry people come out and help, and there are other kinds of things that, that the students at the Job Corps yeah. Center have done, and there are more, I promise you, that they will be doing. So outreach and partnership development in the community is one of our highest priorities. It's probably the one that you're most interested in hearing about, but there are a couple of other things too. Uh, we, we, the center has not performed particularly well. As, as the, uh, you may know, that the, the Job Corps is a statistics-driven program. It's, it's almost incredible. Uh, the, the number of different metrics that are used to gauge the performance of each of the 125 centers across the country, not only gauge the individual center's performance, but to rank it against all of the others. This is really something out of Kafka. <laughs> it feels that way sometimes. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you laugh, but it's true, right? Uh, so, so anyway, so Northlands hasn't been doing very well on some of the important dimensions. So the other area that we're going to be turning our attention to, and this has to do with, with, in some cases, finding new qualified staff, in some cases, hiring incumbent staff and retraining them. But one way or another, we have to turn our attention to those performance things. And they're, they're basic ones. They're things like, like academic achievement. I mean, that's one of the one of the big purposes for which, for which kids are here. Um, and I think that the, so, so the performance aspects, and then I think I mentioned before the kind of profile that the Job Corps Center has here in the community. Uh, Mel and Bill voiced some opinions and, opinions and concerns about how the young people appear, how they behave when they come into town and with what frequency and what numbers and so forth. What we want to do is we want to, uh, and we have plans to, I shouldn't say just that we want to, I think we have plans and we'll put them into practice and you'll be able to look and see and give us feedback. We have plans to work on the culture of that community up there, the culture of staff and the culture of students, so that there is uh, you know, an increase in pride, in self-respect, 
in respect for the, the, the neighborhood that we're in and the desire to be good neighbors. And I think that with that, I, I'll just stop. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I'm sure that we'll be in touch and communicate, but does anyone have any? Uh, any? Yeah, um, I'm not familiar now, as I used to be, with the percentage of Vermonters that are at the Job Corps Center, and I'd like to know what the percentage is and whether there's any goal that is to uh, make that percentage higher as well, far as the Vermonters. We've, we've learned that at present it's between 25 and 30 percent, I believe. That's right? Yeah. Uh, as to whether there's a goal, uh, we, get, we actually get our goal from the feds, okay. and I don't have the information to give you. I can get it for you, but I don't have it for you. We found out that all of the students are from New England, except for the Virgin Islands. Well, there may be a couple from the Virgin Islands. I, 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 told, I told Bill before that, that the Virgin Islands are in the Boston region. <laughs> uh, there are also a handful from across the lake. Oh, okay. Anybody else have any questions? We had a great meeting today. It was it was a pleasure meeting all of well, you. We, and, we and, uh, liked it very much and appreciate it very good. much. Good. Well, let's we'll keep the lines of communication open. We will. Do you mind a question? Though? No, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, I know it may be a touch on this, but certainly you know the chief Merkel has been concerned about the reporting issues. Is that something you discussed today? He couldn't make it. He was so unavailable. He had, he had a family emergency. They are going to meet and yes. discuss it. It's definitely a priority. Yes. Um, and I think from our perspective, we're on the same page. Yes, it is, and, and, and in, a, in an earlier phone call that Mel and I had that was put on hold that may be with some of the, we want to get, we want to get, we want to get the, the issues aired, and the different, if there are differences of opinion, we want to get the differences of opinion aired and work toward a memorandum of understanding that reflects uh, decisions that all parties can uh, accept. And then once that memorandum of understanding is in place, we will guarantee that it will be honored and it will be reliable. That's great. Anybody else? I Any? just have a comment about that particular thing. It's, it's not a new problem. Um, we've had uh, a problem with uh, reporting incidences to the police department for many, many years and several operators before you. So hopefully you're the one with the uh, golden solution. Well, I think, I think the first part, I think the first part, I think there are two parts to the solution. I think the first part is coming together on as many of the points that might be under discussion as possible. Basing the memorandum of understanding on that and working with that and making, you know, building trust that everybody's going to know that all sides can rely on that. The other thing is, I think another approach is that where there are differences, we should conduct ourselves or how the police should conduct themselves that we say, okay, we might not be able to reach an agreement today, but let's experiment with one way or the other for three months or five months or six months. Then we see what happens. We all come back into the room and we say, this is not working. We're going to change. We're going to go back to the other way. Or we say, well, gosh, this is working. Everyone's, everyone's okay. But we, we, can't, we can't be paralyzed. We have to we have to decide to do something, even if it's on an experimental basis. Mm -hmm. else? We look forward to the change. <laughs> <laughs> we, look, we look forward. We look, this is this is uh, very exciting for us. It's, it's it's our company's first job for center. Um, couldn't ask for couldn't ask for a better welcome, uh, and couldn't ask for a, a lovelier setting. Great. Thank you, Howard. Nice to Thank meet you. you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna move down to five B so we can approve C J Haller so they can go home. Um, huh? She brought her. She brought her. She said in. <laughs> so we have an application for a timber and vendor license uh, for C J Haller, Sand Road. Um, trash drop off at uh, the public works area. Wednesdays two to six, Saturdays eight to noon. Um, how many years have you guys been doing this now? Thirteen. Thirteen. Wow. 
So we have an application, we have proof of liability insurance, and we have an application check, so all we need is a motion. I will make a motion to approve. Second. Uh, motion made, motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> You're all set. But could I say something? Yep. Um, of course, I'm always going over there on Wednesdays or Saturdays, and it seems like I'm always hitting when there's a lot of people there. Is there any way that sometimes when we're backing up and then the people are coming out and nobody's moving where we're recycling because they're waiting to put their garbage bags out there. Is there any way that somebody could be there and say, you know, like, because from where your truck is up, it's all open. And you do have one of those things right there, but it's like an open space. So it seems like if somebody could just say, you know, you guys can park up there or, you know, go up that way more so people can get through. Because once they start, there's one time I sat there for almost five and a half minutes, couldn't move couldn't even get up the hill because the people that were also dumping their, their rubbish would stay right in line to make that corner and then everybody was just sitting behind. And you know, I, that, I don't know, it's, it's a hard thing for you to figure we it do, out. We do try to very proactively um, keep most of the line moving. Um, occasionally, it is simply just a detour to turn. Everybody is doing their best. Um, there are times that are higher volume than others. Everybody wants to be first on Wednesday. If you, if you don't like sitting in line, don't try to come before 2.30 on Wednesday. No, it's I'm, ta I'm talking about when we're but <coughs> I, I understand what you're down saying. in the... There are two lanes coming out. Um, more people in the right-hand lane trying to make a right-hand turn are coming to rubbish. Sometimes if somebody doesn't want to stop for rubbish, taking a left-hand turn and going around the block would save them some time. We do try to get down the corners to direct traffic. I know a couple of weeks ago it was a backup. I was trying to direct traffic. I couldn't get the customer's attention because the, the person sitting three cars back was incapable of removing their hand from the form. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. So it really cut down on my ability to, <laughs> they were a bit startled by the person that, you know, and sometimes it's just. We do try to keep Mm -hmm. We really do when it's, when it's locked up, we'll find people to go up around. People get out of their cars, which is, they all go on now. So we have no control over it. No, I know that. You can't make and, them sit. And, and when they do, we try happens, to tell people to go yeah. around. But some people will just sit there anyways. Yeah, well, as long as you can give your best faith effort, <coughs> right. you know, I mean, everybody, we really people, try. people are very patient in some cases. Well, people the time I was there is when there was nobody down there to try to tell them to pull around, because it seems like every time I was there, it was like, you know, people were... One on the other hand, if, I'm, if, we, if I allocate a person to go down on the corner to direct traffic, one, there's some liability there. Um, no, right on the corner, the, right there when you're coming off. Well, yeah, the but that's still directing traffic, which, and... And then we're also slowing the line down because that's one less person removing, there's one less person working actively removing to get the line moving. Because of, but yes, we do, we do, and, and we're aware. Um, um, well, I've just had people come, you know, talking to me about it, and then I've been there a couple of times, so I thought I'd bring it up because there was nobody there, and, and, and if they could have, they could have gone up at that time when I was there. Do you think that there's any, uh there be any benefit of having longer hours than we currently have or is there really periods of time that it's real busy and then there's some slow times that there, there are you can't tell the people when to come yeah and most of the time you know it, it's really busy between 2 and 3 30 um when it starts getting dark at 5 and 4 30 it gets really dead between 5 and 6. yeah um, yeah i know it, it appears correct me if i'm wrong try to serve three people at a time if you're, there's like you try to get three cars and of course it's everybody has and exactly the same have, amount trying to do that and there's a line right and the person in the back is right. going to get out of their car right direct right. you to want to grab a bag of garbage <laughs> it's always the person in the back that does it oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 um and there's you know you really can't say, lady, get in the car and pull up, please. But you really, and, you know, and we, we are aware. Um. I think, you know, one of the things that's, uh, 
it does appear that you are adequately staffed. You've got a, you've got a, I don't want to say you've got an army of staff people down there, but we you've try. got plenty of staff to make sure that you're, it's not like you have two people trying to wait on three people. You know, so I think that that's key is to make sure that your staffing level is, uh, is maintained. Mm -hmm. Could you, uh, could they create a sign that says uh, about staying in your car and we serve the first three people in line, you know? You, you could. Um, and that would, might help, <laughs> that might help, that might help the fact to keep the people in the car. Yeah, there's, there's still people that pull the wrong way going down to the recycling. And that's when you, the trucks go down there for all the day. There's still people that pull into the wrong lane. Really? Not necessarily new people. No. <laughs> Zig, I think you have just bad luck. <laughs> well, you know, if, if, it, if it gets bad, gets worse, and if we have to get together some Saturday and look at it and try and think of a different process, we'll do it. But, you know, we'll work with you and try and make it all work. So. Okay. Um, if you don't have to come, there's no need that somebody has to come. Please don't. Okay. Please don't. No, we'll just and, burn it all. And, and we have, I mean, and, and last year was better because we told people, if you don't need to be here, wait. Please. I mean, because... Christmas and New Year's is both on Wednesday. Yeah, day. I was just checking that. <laughs> yeah. so we're going we're gonna to be open on Thursday. Oh, okay. The yeah. Day after Christmas. Yeah, because actually I've made a range, you know, and I haven't made that telephone call yet, but typically we we increase frequency we, we, during that period of time and Add a, add a day if we can. Um, uh, the fellas will probably, they will be open the first on, on Wednesday. I'm sure of that. So it'll probably just be Christmas week will be open on Thursday instead of Wednesday. The we first, the the first week will be open. Okay. Yeah. You know, it might, uh, let, me, let me talk to them because it might not be a bad idea to see if we can't do Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I know, was it last year? We did that. Hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was. Okay. It's all right because you get trained. Yeah. Okay. It was not. It didn't work. It's just people are. They're, tra they're trained. trained. The train. They're, they're well, like. We used to Wednesday, Friday, yeah. okay. Wednesday, Friday, not Thursday, but yeah. we got some, but not. Well, obviously, one of the keys, and I, it happened to us one year where Casella showed up at 159 when it started at two, and the key, one of the key is, is on, on Wednesdays after Christmas, you really need to get there at least 30 minutes, if not 45 minutes before the start time, because that's when cars start lining up, and so we added, we added like an hour or something to the uh, to the deal with them, and we just need to coordinate that with you so that you're aware of the same. Fine. Same to you. Great. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Bye. Uh, two sets of minutes need approval. We have the regular council meeting of October 22nd. Uh, has everyone had a chance to read them? Ziggy made a motion to accept. Second by Lowell. Any corrections, additions? All in favor? Aye. 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 And we had a special meeting on November 5th to... Um, receive the petition for the uh, gas referendum and I will accept a motion to accept those minutes. Lowell, motion made. Second. Ziggy will second that. That meeting lasted about 10 minutes and uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 I abstained. I wasn't there. Thank you Randy for abstaining. Okay, so that's done. Where are the warrants? We don't see them anywhere. I had them. They're I in think the stack? They're, I think they're on. Oh, you know what? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are right there. Okay, we can start passing those around because I didn't, I didn't see them anywhere. Um, we have on the agenda Kennedy Brothers Inc. license agreement for the road. Um, Bob has not gotten back to us, and Mel actually found a few small issues with it. So I don't know that we need to go into it tonight. We have other things we need to discuss. So I think we're going to table that till the next meeting. One of the things there is, is in your packet the map and so on. So yeah. maps certainly need some work. Uh, there's the way that I wrote it was for, in essence, exclusive use for Kennedy Brothers for their parking. 
And in looking at it um, more carefully today, there's a portion of that area that's actually used by country-owned products uh, in there. You know, they, they actually back into that. Uh, they have a couple of warehouses there, and they did a lot of work relative <coughs> to the loading docks there. So trash that map. We'll come back with one that will make uh, more sense. Yeah. And I, like as Bill said, I, I didn't hear back from, from Bob relative to the language. And uh, it is something that's needed for the Development Review Board to be able to entertain a future application and a, an expected application for other uses at Kennedy Brothers. Okay. Uh, Virginia Community Development Review Committee, which is also known as the, uh, the Maynard Building Revolving Loan Fund. We have the Revolving Loan Fund. Uh, the proceeds come from the Maynard Building on Main Street, and there is a committee that is um, responsible for making decisions on those loan requests. The committee has a two-year term. Uh, the term actually ended in March of 2013, and I did not was not aware of that, and Mel brought it to my attention a couple weeks ago. So we've uh, looked at the list of people and looked at the at the policy and so on. We have a, a a couple of changes, and I want to announce um, some new board members, and hopefully we can vote on this and, and reconstitute this board. Um, there were seven members, according to the policy, uh, banker, real estate broker, member of the city council, city treasurer, representative of the Virginia's Partnership, representative of the Greater Virginia's Chamber of Commerce, and a citizen at large. We no longer have a Greater Virginia's Chamber of Commerce. Um, Mel and I talked about that, and since this isn't really, I don't think that we need to have seven members or an odd number, we thought it would be wise just to take that line item off, at least for now. If we get a chamber and they want to be put on here, we can do that. Um, what we've done is I've talked to some of the people that have served before. Um, Lynn, you were on as a broker. Um, since you're on the council, I thought you might step off, is that fine? I, I talked to Nancy Laro, see if she'd be interested, and she said she would be honored to serve. Um, I did talk to Chris Collette, and she was the banker. She's willing to serve. Ziggy, you're the council member. If you want to stay on, that's great. Didn't know. Um, you know, yeah. don't think it's a big burden. No. <laughs> um, Joan is our treasurer. Um, Scott Gaines was the representative from the Chamber of Commerce. He has agreed to take over the position for the Gents Partnership. And I talked to Henry Broughton. He was our citizen at large, and he's willing to serve again as well. So if those six names sound okay to you, um, do we have a motion on this? Probably. Um, yeah, the other thing that we, we also want to do is change the name of this committee because it's confusing. It's called the Virgins Community Development Review Committee, and we get it. It can easily get confused with the Virgins Development Review Board. Yeah. So maybe that's what the committee needs to do is come up with a name, yeah. a better name. But yeah. if, to me, it ought to be something about Revolving Loan Fund. You know, that's yeah. what we Essentially, that's what it is. Why don't you just call it the Virgins Revolving Loan Fund? There you go. Okay. That's <laughs> board. That's <laughs> committee. No, no it, it sounds good to me. <laughs> right. Right that's to the one. point. I think we discussed that when we had the first meeting, why it was that, and yeah. we changed it. It was on the agenda, and I wrote Mel an email saying, is this the revolving loan committee? Because I didn't, I wasn't really sure. So, great. So, um, will someone uh, make, a motion. make a motion, please? Second. Okay, for the those six members. <coughs> Second, Lowell. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you. And so that this appointment will go until March of 2014. 2000. Is it a year or two? It's years? two years. So it's 15. 15. 15. 15. Right. You're right. I received a call a week or two ago from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Um, Chris Jarrett, who works there, they were um, writing a grant proposal for 2014 education program that was going to be named Up the Creek. Um, and it was going to include um, participants that would basically um, paddle, row, uh, up and down Otter Creek, looking at uh, wildlife, nature, talking about history, 
Um, they have lots of different partners and educators and so on that we're going to work on this with a variety of disciplines, um, ecology, natural history, human history, bird, plant, fish, and animal species, uh, pollution, farm runoff, and so on. It sounded fascinating. And they just wanted to make sure that the city of Virginia would support them in this effort in their grant application. If they got the grant, they would come back to us and we talk about details. They wanted to have availability for boats in at Falls Park and so on. Uh, nothing that seemed onerous. So I just, I said I'd bring it up to the meeting. We don't need a boat on it, but if, if it's okay, we'll just say, great, we're supporting you at this point and come back when you need more details. Rennie? Yeah, actually we have um, actually done a grant for them uh, in the past. Um, because of the way the grant was, the, the city actually had to be the grant um, vehicle. Sponsor, rip vehicle. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know whether they ever got that. It was for uh, doing the preliminary work for a um, restoration facility. Uh, there, there's one of the um, revolutionary boats that's yeah. on the bottom, uh, which they would like to bring up. Um, but they can't bring it up unless it can go into this restoration facility, which sinks it into a certain kind of fluid mm -hmm. for a certain amount of time because it would disintegrate if it came out into the air. And there's only one of them in the country, and it's in Texas, I think. And they would like to have one here. Um, it's a multi-million dollar facility, but you have to go through this preliminary grant stuff to get the study as to how it's going to be built, where it could be built, and so on. And, and we needed to support them. So there, there's a... We've already established a precedent of supporting them in, in things, and I don't know whether that ever came along. I haven't heard anything from I it, so I guess they, yeah. they didn't get it. It was, it was highly competitive. So. Yeah. Well, this seems to be you know, pretty, uh, pretty low, low maintenance in terms of what the city would require. So. Uh, okay, um, holiday light costs. This is, uh, I don't want this to get into a 20-minute discussion, but we, I was talking, Mel and I were talking about lighting of various things, and Jimmy Lero was, was, came in and we were talking about the park lights, which, are, which I think are actually beautiful. And, and he was bemoaning the fact that it takes them a couple of days to put up the lights. And they have to buy, the, buy new, new lights every year because some of them don't work and it gets to take more time if you don't have new lights. So we figured out it cost about $3,000 a year to purchase the lights and install them and take them down. In, in cash and, and labor costs. And you know, Mel and I talked about it, and we went down to the park and looked around a little bit and so on, and, and I thought, well, yeah, maybe there's a way we can reconfigure this or something. And so I ended up asking a couple of folks that week about it, and, and I got, everyone said they loved the lights the way they are, and they didn't want to change it because it really is a great, makes the city green look beautiful, and it really makes Virginians look great at Christmas time. And I said, okay, well, let's just bring it up to the council for a quick discussion. And, and actually, I was, so I was doodling this afternoon, and I, I calculated this $3,000 cost, and it's $2.5 for a $2,000, $200,000 home. So I don't think it's really a, a financial burden on anybody. But the one thing that apparently happened, when these first started to happen, some of the fraternal organizations offered to contribute some of the cost for the lights and so on. Is that right? You, your understanding? Well, it's before my time. Uh, was it before your time too? During my time, the chamber so. used to buy them. And Did they? We used to put them up. Okay. So, so anyway, the, so the yeah. chamber nobody buys them anymore. We do, and and I said, well, yeah, maybe there's maybe there's some kind of a partnership we can forge with with some organizations where we can either get you know a little bit of cash or a little bit of labor or something. Um, I just wanted some input because Jimmy needs to order the lights, and we need to figure out where we're going to put them up. Um, Relatively soon. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I so, vote yeah. no change. Lynn votes no change. I'll second that. Ziggy votes no change. Joe? No change. I like I love those lights. You like them. Yeah. Randy? <laughs> I mean, okay. Randy? I think we should go with them, but I, I think we should consider whether we do them the same way as we've done them. But I, I think we're, I was out that day when yeah. you and Mal were out on the Right, yeah, that's right. About yeah. And talked about whether instead of just hanging them totally on um, the branches, wrapping them around the 
the uh, trunks of the trees and then only coming up part of the way into the branches, which would do a couple of things. One, it's easier to put on. Secondly, they would not be as uh, susceptible to the wind, which is, is what might causes them to go them. out. Might not ruin them. Yeah. Um, and um, so, I mean, that, that was just one thought. At, at one time, back a few years ago, when I was manager, we looked at um, getting the, um, what's the other kind of lights that last? LEDs. LEDs, LEDs. LEDs. yes. LEDs. Which are, which are a, a lot more expensive to buy, they but they last longer. Yeah. yeah, that's what we use. That's um, what we get now. Yeah. Is that what we have yeah. now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. and they still go every year, huh? Yeah. Well, I, it's funny because I look really those the wind. Yeah. It's really yeah. the wind gets the wind. And probably the, the, and probably the removal that, that may fray some of the wires or knock some of the bulbs. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah, they are expensive. And actually, I was reading online some, and they say that even with those, there is a, a, a factor, damage factor or something. If you go to Home Depot, they'll replace them for you for free. But uh, so there you go. You can find them at Home Depot. I think we should definitely do it. I mean, if we have, if we have an organization that wants to contribute, that's great. But I, I think just one of those things that. It's city. a holiday. It's we Christmas. Ought to do it. I mean, it's Christmas. Christmas. That, you know. And they do look wonderful. Money. Let's do it on Christmas. You know? <laughs> All right, I'll break that news for him. All right. Yeah, he's not, he, you know, once in a while, he's just got to do it. So. Maybe we can experiment with wrapping a couple of trunks just to see what they look like. The holiday yeah. strolls like in less than, or it's two weeks from, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's when they usually light them, right? Yeah. So they better. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, city owner's review. Did you get that spreadsheet put together? I didn't, Bill. Okay. But, but, but that's what's headed your way. Yeah. We're actually going to take, Bill, Bill has a bunch of notes of who's assigned to what, and I haven't been keeping score. So I forgot we're going to create a spreadsheet. We're going to create a spreadsheet for you, certainly for the next meeting. We may email it to you to show you where you fit in this uh, in this scheme. In this scheme right? um, yeah, and, and, and Rennie talked about going to the VLCT website and looking at ordinances. I went and I couldn't find any. I, they prob Mel thinks they're there. Yeah, I just couldn't find yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go to the resource library. And I've got, I mean, I printed out some, there's a noise and a parking and a dog ordinance and a park ordinance. Maybe I did the dog. These are from Middlebury. <laughs> I'll did. give them to whoever works on what. Um, but the other thing that, that this ties into is that Mel and I had a meeting today with Jeff Margolis, who is our webmaster, about just kind of rearranging parts of the website. And we want to have all of the ordinances and the policies available on the website as just like a, as a PDF. And so it would be smart for us to have them revised and rewritten, you know, by the time we get this this update done and so on. So there will be something coming out, and we'll get the committees going and so on. So I apologize for the delay, but it happens. Life happens. Life if, happens. Did we ask whether the resource center would, would actually help us to revise? The, I have the not. System? That's not a bad idea. Yeah, because I, I, yeah. I think that's one of the functions of them being there is to help communities with their ordinances and policies. I can certainly call them and ask them. And they, they may actually say, well, send them to us and we'll give you a preliminary review of them. And yeah, okay. At least get them up, it may, you know, get them up to the legal part. Yep. Right, up to uh, the yep, yep. legal. <laughs> okay, that's a great idea. Okay. Uh, Mel, sure. you're up. Yeah, I'm, uh, let me just you have a budget report. I actually have not had time to uh, go through it in any, any detail, but uh, it's obviously going to change here when the snow comes. <laughs> I handed out a uh, police station budget report, and uh, they're, uh, we're still in good, we're, we're fine at this point. You know, we had a change order, the two change orders, one dealing with epoxy floor for the two holding cells, and the other change order dealing with the surge tank, which ended up costing $2,400 as opposed to $4,400. I won't go into the whole arguments of, you know, what happened there, but really, it's the, it's really the easiest escape, is just to pay the $2,400 and call it, a, and call it a day, as opposed to, um, there, the, um, what, you, we could, put, we could do anything. We could put a two-inch line all the way down to in front of Kennedy Brothers uh, with a directional boring, which they think would cost eleven thousand dollars, which could quickly turn into twenty-two. The the other alternative would be to put a line across. Was the other idea was to put a line across the street. The problem is we found out that that line is underneath Country Home Products building, so that sure. that building is built over over that line. So. I just felt, uh, in, when I talked with the water district, 
you know, we don't have any proof. There's no proof that the water district told the owner at the time that they were discontinuing the line, and we don't have any proof that they didn't tell them. So I just want to move on and just pay the 2400 bucks. The toilets will flush. We'll be just fine. Uh, the, so that were the only, those are really the only, those are the only surprises, if you will, that we have in this. We, uh, we did meet with our uh, phone person and our computer person and the security person yesterday and today, and we have that all worked out. Uh, I suspect that there will be a little bit of overage in, uh, it's amazing how many data ports you need for uh, this uh, stuff. <laughs> so anyway, it'll, uh, we, and we actually, one of the things we don't want to do is, is we want to plan ahead a little bit because it costs you 10 times more to add a data port down the road it is to just throw it in the wall when the walls are sitting there wide open so we're uh, we're gonna take care of that but at this point I met with uh, Don Johnson he's the surveyor that we engaged to deal with the Vermont Industrial Parks property I met with him he's he's basically got the survey done uh, other than incorporating more precisely the sewer easement for the new line that wraps around that will serve the train station and the, the service line to uh, uh, the new service line to the police station. So once we get that done, that will allow us to engage WMAT to prepare the deed and easement, and then we can settle up with uh, uh, with Vermont Industrial Park. So probably the station will be done be before we get that <laughs> get that final land deal uh, done. But anyway, so that's uh, uh, that'll be taken care of. So all in all. You know, it's uh, it's going good. Bill, you went in. You, uh, went in. Uh, yeah, you know, they, they meet every Tuesday morning at eight o'clock, and I went in last Tuesday and had a had a interesting tour with everybody. And it's the building. It's funny that the slab looks small, and then the frame looked big, and then you go inside, and some rooms look good, some rooms look big, and some rooms look small. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that overall, it, the the feeling is good, and the, the chief seems happy, and. Um, and I, you know, as far as the budget's concerned, so far so good. Yeah. You know, at some point, I tell you, like today, I mean, it was a zoo in there. I mean, there was electricians in there. And it was, it was, we couldn't give them the walkthrough. But at some point, if, if folks are interested mm -hmm. in, uh, we can, I'm happy to coordinate a walkthrough. I think it yeah, probably either, either, be on a Saturday. Well, we talked about either, Saturday. you know, like a three or four in the afternoon before it gets real dark or a Saturday morning or something. And they're happy to meet us there. So if that's something Saturday that. Saturday morning would be. The easiest. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, we can certainly do it, and whoever wants to come can can do it for half an hour or so. But it's. Uh, I would like to see the inside of the building. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it all, the, all the inter. I'm sorry. Is it ahead of schedule? Because it looks. It is ahead of schedule. Yeah. Yeah. It looks yeah. like it is. You know, had favorable weather. Yeah. They had a. They've got a four week window for mechanicals. You know, like rough ends and stuff. And everybody's saying, well, they ought to be able to do it in two, but they put in four because you never know. So. So far, so good. And, and if things I'm, keep going, you know, a little bit ahead of schedule, that would be fantastic. I know they move fast on that roof. Yeah, roof's, yeah. roof's done. It's all insulated. The yeah. exterior insulation is done. All of the steel studs are, are in, are in. inside are, are, are up. They, um, the the exterior is all set for the uh, the cement board, and there has there's some cement board put in on the on the north side, and the contractor. Had to go to St. Johnsbury somewhere because their materials just showed up, and so they they had to be pulled off the job, and so they'll be back uh, doing the uh, doing the exterior just as soon as they get off that job. Yeah. But you know, it's you know, it's it's come along fine. Yeah. Yeah. Where is the? I just noticed it today. Where is the gas? I assume that the gas tank, yeah, uh, which is propped off there, but that is not the location where it's going to be. Uh, well, the you, there's a temporary tank for right now but we're going to have two 500 gallon above ground tanks uh, on a gravel pad on the south side of the building in anticipation of Vermont gas coming to project <laughs> uh, we actually let me just tell you we you know the uh, our zoning per, our zoning permit that we got from the development review board waived the requirement to screen these two 500 gallon Propane well, for 24 months. Yeah, until, <laughs> until Vermont gas shows up, and there won't be any tanks at all. So, so that's not; those are not the tanks that you're seeing here. Yeah. 
There's a there's a rental heater out back yeah. that's blowing. Uh, so those furnaces would be very adaptable to to our Absolutely. natural gas. Yeah. You just got to you got to change the little nozzles. Okay. Yeah. There's, a, there's a conversion yeah. kit, but yeah. yeah. So yeah. anyway, that's that. Well, so in terms of a Saturday, I mean, it's going to be busy the next. I mean, <clears throat> would anyone have any preference? Then we can talk to Brett Loaf about. I like to see it more done. Okay. Because right now, you want to wait like the, like the beginning early. of December. Yeah. There's, there's a holiday stroll. There's no sheetrock up at all. Yeah, I like all to see the steel studs are, are so, so maybe are, after that uh, middle of December. I'm just, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll see what we can do. That'd be better for me. Okay. So I'm gonna burn burn through a few other items. Uh, seemed like it was long ago that we uh, we talked about the government shutdown and how that affected us, and it did affect us in a couple things. One is we have one part time officer that. Has a, was working under a federal grant through Women Safe, and we we uh, we and they work together. We just continue to have her work, and you're all set with that, Joan, right? Yeah. We bill them and we pay it. No issues there. The cops grant, uh, we put in a reimbursement request every three months, and at the end of the quarter, the government site was shut down. I couldn't file a request for reimbursement. He kept the police officer working, waited through, and. Put in a request for reimbursement, Joan. You got the check in six or seven days from the yeah. bank. So Good. anyway, it's all set for you. Uh, insurance claim pump station. Uh, we got a. Uh, we put in a a partial settlement request of a little over sixty thousand dollars. Got that check, right, Joan? Got that check. Got that <laughs> check. I was thinking of that. Okay. The, the pump station check. You got yeah. a check for sixty thousand dollars. We probably have somewhere between. Certainly between twenty and thirty, probably twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars more. There's, uh, we still, well, actually, there's a bill in here to Cortland Construction for seventeen or twenty thousand yeah. dollars. That's the that's the installer of the pump station, and then there'll be a bill from uh, our what's a company? What's your son's company? Is it RCI? RCI. 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 We'll get a bill from them, and then we'll get a bill from. Mission control, which is the data alarm system that's there, and uh, I explained to them that there's some there's a fire department bill coming uh, that's in there, and there's actually a public works and sewer bill because there was a fair amount of overtime that was the result of this. So, now we won't go crazy with it, but anyway, we were uh, but they paid the whole thing. There was no issue. Remember, at one point I thought, oh shit, you know we're yeah. gonna. This is going to be a problem. Well, you were looking you know, at getting a depreciated really, cost yeah, as opposed to replacement no, cost. You know, not an issue. Good. Uh, not an issue at this point. And I've, I've kept BLCP passive uh, advised all along the way. And I and when I told them I got the partial check that closed the, the close claim, I said, well, you know, good. Put, but make sure you can open, reopen that in case we don't quite get made whole. Because they will make us whole. There's no, no question there. Uh, sprinkler system. Uh, I think at the last meeting I told you that Jesse Dobiecki was here and they did they did the inspection and it passed. It took us about two or three weeks to finally get the actual results, and there was two items in there that uh, we got a conditional we got a conditional approval. They uh, Alpine they were they were down in the office yesterday, right, Joan? Yeah. Uh, uh, they need to have a a uh, fire department connection to the dry system that's out at the end of the alley and they've figured out how they're gonna plumb that. That was item number one. Item number two, which we knew about, was that the alarm panel did not have enough zones to uh, on it to accommodate all of the things associated with this sprinkler system. And so that's item number two. And this panel got put in, in uh, panel got put in in 1997. And, uh, and they needed an expansion card, all right? 19, 16 years ago, I needed an expansion card. Found an expansion card, the eight zone expansion. What are the odds of that? <laughs> they got a hold of an expansion card for the eight zone, eight zone expansion card. So uh, we've got them working on that. And um, uh, it get, we're protective. The sprinkler system, it's running, it's all set. We got the public works guys, uh, Matt and and Pat come up every, on the first of every month, <coughs> test the uh, the fire pump, make sure that's good. Uh, don't forget, we, we fronted the Friends of Virginia Opera House $52,588. Uh, I put together the request to obtain the the uh, downtown historic tax credits, and uh, 
the check came in, I don't know, either Monday or last Friday, you know, made payable to the Friends of Virgin's Opera House, and their treasurer came up and signed the back of it and gave it to Jones. We got $32,588 <laughs> here. The Vermont Arts Council grant, which is the other $20,000, uh, their process is, is, uh, <laughs> is, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a project to get your money. Them and part of the frog, uh, it's a shared. Jerry Ann knows what she has to do. I know what I have to do. They will not release that money until we have an unconditional. Here are the buildings protected. You'd think they could release the twenty thousand bucks. I mean, it it did what it, the grant did what it's supposed to do. But they don't like the fact that we got this conditional approval. So they uh, so obviously that's motivating us to get that uh, get that done. Associated with this. Uh, I had uh, one of the things that I didn't pick up on when we got the inspection results, but the, their their uh, report carried the same occupancy limit that it had been carrying for years of 150, right? And it just didn't jump off the page to me because I'm reading I'm, I'm reading the conditions part. Well, it jumped off the page for Jerry Ann mm -hmm. uh, saying, "What the hell is th th is this?" So. So anyway, I, we, I had Jesse come down, pointed it out to him. He said, well, that's just, that's what we had in my computer. He, nobody asked me to reset that. I said, well, we need this thing reset. We got Jamie Thurston coming here in a matter of a week or so. So uh, <laughs> anyway, he came down, did all kinds of calculations, measured stairs. It's a science about figuring out, yeah, it is. figuring out capacity. And we think that we're going to end up with a number of, I, I think the number is going to be 285. At the end of the day, it won't be 300. The uh, determining factor is the stairway that leads down the, the, the main stairway in the front. That width of that stairway is is a determining factor. So we'll get the we'll get the 285. I did point out to Jerry Ann that they need to change the way that they've got their chairs set up up in the balcony. The uh, the balcony actually ends up with less, and it's. it's really just because of square footage up there. There really can only be 41 people up in the balcony. Uh, so that's where they're, that's why they're dropping down. Part of the reason why it's to 285 as opposed to 300 and some odd. So, so anyway, that's, we're almost there on the sprinkler yeah. system. We got our trash grant, uh, yep. the, uh, you know, all of the trash receptacles that we bought. Uh, that check should be coming Joan soon. The way that it worked is the executive board, we applied for $5,111 and some change and the executive board only had authority to give $5,000. I said, just send me the $5,000, that would be okay. Well, they, they put it on the agenda of the full board. We're supposed to get $5,111.86, so <laughs> we're good with that. Yep, so we got, what, how many, 20, 20 trash cans for $5,000? Yeah, yeah. Joe, do you want to talk about your grant? I, I do, sure. I would, thank you very much. Yeah. As many of you know, we've been planning a toddler playground, um, and I, I believe last meeting we mentioned that we had applied for a grant for $25,000. We were awarded $21,000, which I think is pretty good. So uh, uh, we received a $21,000 grant from the state recreation facilities, facilities or grant. Community facilities. Right. Yeah. So we'll be having a meeting, the Recreation Committee will be meeting this Saturday. I've asked uh, David Raphael to upgrade the, um, the one of the biggest com uh, concerns from area residents was parking. So I've asked him and he has agreed to upgrade the plan to include parking and we'll be discussing that this Friday and I'll have some more information for you next time around. Great, okay. Just uh, three other little items oh, I wanna, oh, sorry. If I could just add, I wanted to thank Mel and Tara Brooks for a lot of work on that grant. I wanted to make sure that they were publicly thanked. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good. <clears throat> just a couple other things. I just want to let you know that the, the DRB and the Planning Commission are uh, they're working me to death is what they're what they're doing. They uh, the DRB. It's I don't know that I can remember a time when they were uh, we got we got loyal loyal. loyal. <laughs> Uh, we have one. We have one member actually was had some illness in their family, and so Lowell, Lowell's been a regular. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's really and and Lowell, you know, there's no different than Zig. All of a sudden, you don't find out about it until three thirty in the afternoon. We need somebody at six o'clock. You know, so anyway, Lowell, Lowell's been <laughs> filling actually, in. Well, it's in the afternoon. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you go last year? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the the DRB uh, they had a they had a hearing on the. The Neal's family market last uh, last night, 
and uh, they'll be going into deliberative session, which involves obviously converting what is currently Deniker's service uh, office to to uh, Neil's family market. So the, the DRB is busy with that uh, with that application. The other application is back in 2007. The DRB uh, reviewed and actually approved a project called Claybrook, uh, which is uh, on on the bourgeois property, if you will. And then they just, what happened with that project in 2007 was obviously, if you recall the economy in 2007, uh, it just was not the time to start doing a $3 million real estate uh, development project in the Virginia's Vermont. Uh, and so what they did is they, they split that project up. They abandoned that large project, split it up, did the seven lot uh, project along Hopkins Road. I think four lots have been sold, right, Lynn? And, and yeah. so there's, I know I'll give that in another year, that, that'll be done. And so Peter Kahn has put the other part of this project on, on the table. So there's a public hearing scheduled for December 2nd uh, for a 50 unit plan unit development on that, uh, on that parcel. Good. The, uh, the Planning Commission also met last night. They're, uh, I'm gonna say about you know, at least 25% of the way into their municipal development plan uh, rewrite. You know, you, it's how fast five years goes. That well, was, it's uh, more of an update, isn't it? It's not well, a rewrite or you know, not? You know, it's, uh, it's funny. I was explaining to the board last night that we really thought that this was going to be pretty simple. You have this beautiful plan you're going to go through. We're going to update the data and we'll be able to document the various changes. And then when you get into it, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in five years that, you know, like police station, the city acquiring the swimming pool, toddler park, you know, there's lots of things that are at a different point. So um, we haven't abandoned the thought of being able to deliver an updated plan to the city council where you could see exactly what the changes are. But if this document gets to change, you end up with a 400 page document and, and you won't have me bringing you a 400 page document. So <laughs> it's still early, but anyway, they're, they're, you know, Shannon's got the whip out there. He's <laughs> we'll, uh, getting here. I think it'll, we hope to get this to the city council. I think the tar, I really think the target is the first of June. That's what I think because it expires in September. I think it's September. Uh, okay. So that's the plan on that. That's all I had, Bill. Okay. Um, one other thing quickly that Mel brought in the sign oh, here. Yeah. Yeah. This is the uh, Grigens Burying Ground Cemetery sign, which uh, Pat Crowley did the uh, lettering and Rebecca Duffy did the Weeping Willow. And so we're gonna keep that uh, until probably spring. Um, Sue Furlan was getting some estimates on the fence, and, and I then I went down the Middlebury fence, and we decided on a shorter fence. Uh, don't have a price on it yet, but the plan is to maybe have, have it all set and ready to go in the spring. So we'll have a, a fence along Mountain View and uh, school and the new sign and at least spruce that cemetery up. Um, the other thing that I'll bring you up to date on was the courtyard, which we discussed at length a few weeks ago. Um, Jerry Ann presented the courtyard plan, you know, the, the, the large ball bow plan. Conceptually, we all kind of agreed on it, but there were issues about parking, um, and then there were cost issues. And I, so we wouldn't have to deal with it on a, on a you know, regular meeting basis, and because time was of the essence, I appointed a committee to, to look into that plan. And it was Mellon Joan, Shannon Haggett, uh, Rennie Perry, Jerry Ann Smart, and Terry Faith Wise. Um, they had a meeting. Um, I think there was a big concern about the, 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 the loss of parking spaces. One of the other issues that came up that Shannon and Mel thought about was, was important is that technically the marquee is within the highway right of way, which is illegal. And to move it another 10 feet further makes it even more illegal. And the precedent that that would set relative to the city and other I applicants. I had one person so come up and he says, not only is it on Main Street, you got it on 22A. Yeah. He said, you just 
you yeah, know, so as much as we liked that. that plan, there were there were a lot of things that actually came to the floor after the discussion. So then there was a smaller bulb out that was going to keep two parking spaces. It didn't alleviate the illegality of the marquee. Um, and then there was there were some other issues about elevation. And so the Opera House, Jerry Ann has said, you know, we just want to sell bricks and we want to restore our marquee. <laughs> And at this point, the, the committee ha it will be meeting again to finalize a plan and put a budget together. But I think that the, it, it appears that the sidewalk will probably remain with the way it is. The marquee will stay <coughs> where it is. There may be some additional lighting. There may be some, some limbing up of some trees. There are going to be some things to make it more visible. It will have granite curbing, the bricks, and so on and so forth. I, I'm, I'm staying out of it. <laughs> this is what I know from the committee. But I think that probably in December, they want to come here with a final plan and a budget that we can look at and, and discuss. Because I asked quite a few people, you know, and then people were asking me. So I just, I think probably 12 or 13 people, and they were all <coughs> people at the Opera House, too, and they just felt that maybe, you know, it shouldn't. The parking places were very important. Yeah. You know, yeah. everybody. Well, I mean, you know, once you once you get into the detail, and everyone, you know, there there were a lot of issues. So, it'll look better regardless, and, and everybody, it'll be a win-win. It's, you know, I think there was a, a few tense moments, but it, it's behind us, so that's good. <laughs> um, and well, I mention about about Gittier's. Uh, oh yeah, the uh, briefly, <coughs> I did I did meet with Jim Lamette about. About this and uh, about, well, I didn't about Didier Marat. Didier Marat, the, the, uh, the South Water Street piece of land correct. that we talked about. Yep, yep. I also was able to locate the entire survey. Uh, yeah, the uh, it was a Lee Lowell survey, and Mike McGune, who's a surveyor in Ferrisburg, he ended up, it was somebody else who owned the surveys in between, but anyway, I was able to track. Uh, track that down and I have two copies of that and they're actually going to get a they're going to be a get a mylar I think part of the reason why I was half a survey is because the survey that I have in 1968 of Albert Frost property is before he sold off a chunk to uh, to the house that, that that's there so as it turns out that lot isn't 2.55 acres it's about 1.55 acres really so anyway We'll get, we'll get that. We'll uh, get that all squared away. Yeah, and yeah. so the public, uh, there was a 30-day notice requirement. Jim just couldn't uh, get the paperwork together in time for a December public hearing. So it'll be a January, we think the first meeting in January will be your public hearing. Notices will go out to, to uh, interested parties. Yep. And one last thing, we talked about the, uh, we were talking about the gas line, and we were, Mel and I were curious about the revenue that it was going to bring the city. And they, they gave us the total linear footage of gas line. And I guess it's valued at $20 a linear foot. And we were all excited. And it's actually a little over $9,000 a year. So it's less than a penny on the tax, less than half a penny on the tax rate. So we're not going to get rich on it, but it's better than nothing. Right. So anyway, that's anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Not right now. No? You guys all set? Make motion to adjourn. I'll second. Made in second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great.